Although they, the insects, have grown endlessly more complicated, perhaps for geological periods, like Chinese written characters, it looks as though they will not manage to change levels, as if their impetus or fundamental metamorphosis has been arrested. You know, maybe this comment about Chinese uh, character writing is evidence of a bit of Eurocentrism on Taylor's part. Um, there's a lot of research into the differences between alphabetic writing and uh, character, Chinese uh, character writing, there are other forms of Japanese, Korean, so forth. Um, and, you know, we'll, this controversy will just pass over lightly. And when we think about it, we begin to see certain reasons for the fact that they are at a standstill. They are too small, first of all. An external chitina skeleton, uh, chit, chitin is, I guess, the stuff that the exoskeletons are made of, is a poor solution for the quantitative development of organs. In spite of repeated sheddings, the carapace is a prison, and it rapidly gives way under increasing interior volumes. The insect cannot grow more than a few centimeters without becoming dangerously fragile, for no matter how much we have sometimes belittled questions of size, we cannot deny that by the very fact that they are linked to a material synthesis, certain qualities can be manifested only above certain quantities. Higher psyches physically require larger brains. Next, precisely because of their size, perhaps, the insects show a strange psychic inferiority exactly where we would be tempted to place their superiority. Our own dexterity is put to shame before the astonishing precision of their movements and constructions. Yet, be careful. Observe more closely. This perfection stems, in the end, from the extreme rapidity with which their psychology is hardened and mechanized. It has been demonstrated conclusively that the insect has an appreciable margin of uncertainty of choice at its disposal for its operations. But hardly are its actions formulated when they seem to become weighed down by a habit, by habit, and soon are transcribed into organically set reflexes. One might say that, at, that as their consciousness becomes extroverted, it automatically and continually stiffens. One, first of all, in its behaviors, which grow more and more precise through immediately recorded corrections, and two, eventually in its somatic morphology, where distinctive characteristics disappear, absorbed by their function. This results in those kinds of adjustments of organs and movements that rightfully astonished uh, Faber, who is uh, uh, Jean-Henri Faber, who uh, wrote a series of studies on the insects and habits of insects. Um, yeah, that's not important. The results, this results in those kinds of adjust, adjustments of organs and movements that rightfully astonished Faber, and also in the simply prodigious constructions that group the swarms of hive or, or uh, termitary into a single living machine. A paroxysm of consciousness, if you like, but one that fuses the inside with the outside, so that it becomes materialized in rigid arrangements a movement that is the direct inverse of concentration. B, the mammals. Leaving the insects, therefore, let us now turn to the mammals. Right away, we feel at ease here, and so much so, that this sense of relief could be credited to an anthropocentric impression. Is the fact that we can breathe, now that we have left hive and termitary, simply because we are at home among the higher vertebrates? Oh, how the threat of relativity still hangs over our minds. And yet, no, it is impossible for us to be mistaken. At least in this case, we are not deceived by an impression, but is, it is our intelligence that really makes the judgment, with the power it has to appreciate certain absolute values. No, if a fury quadruped, if a furry quadruped does not seem so animated, literally so alive compared to an ant. This is not just because together with it we find ourselves in our own family zoologically. In the cat, the dog, and the dolphin's behavior, there is something so supple 
and unexpected, so much given to exuberance for life and to curiosity. In this case, instinct is no longer channeled and paralyzed in a single function, as in the spider or the bee. It remains flexible, individually and socially. It takes an interest in everything, flutters about, plays. In fact, it is an entirely different form of insect and knows nothing itself of the boundaries imposed on a tool by the limits of precision it has attained. Unlike the insect, the mammal is already no longer an element strictly enslaved to the phylum on which it has appeared. An aura of freedom and a flicker of personality begin to hover around it. And this, consequently, is the direction in which unknown and never-ending possibilities outline themselves ahead. But who, then, will eventually dash toward those promised horizons? Let us take another and more detailed look at the immense horde of Pliocene animals, at those limbs brought to the height of simplicity and perfection, those forests of antlers crowning the heads of stags, those leers spiraling up from the starred or striped foreheads of the antelopes, those tusks weighing down the muzzles of the uh, probascidians, those fangs and cutting hooks in the jaws of the large carnassials, is it not precisely such, such luxuriance and such achievement that condemn the future of these magnificent creatures, regardless of the vitality of their psyche? Do they not mark for imminent death forms that are pinned in a morphological dead end? Are we not watching the end of something rather than its beginning? Yes, true. But aside from the polycladines, uh, the strepsiros, the strepsiros, the, the elephants, the machaerodons, and so many others, there are still the primates. See the primates. Until now, I have only mentioned the primates once or twice in passing. When I spoke of the tree of life, I did not assign any place to these forms so close to our own. The omission was deliberate. At that point in my argument, their importance still had not revealed itself. The primates could not have been understood. Now, however, after what we have seen of the hidden driving force that moves zoological evolution, at this faded moment at the close of the tertiary, they can and must make their entrance. Their hour has come. Morphologically, like all other animal groups, the primates form as a whole series of fans or overlapping vertices, clearly marked out at the periphery and blurred in the region of their pendicles. At the top, we have the monkeys, properly speaking, with their two large geographical branchings, the authentic Old World uh, Catarine monkeys with 32 teeth, and the South American Platyrrhine monkeys with a flat snout, all with 36 teeth. Below are the Lemurids, which generally have an elongated snout, often with forward slanting incisors. At the very base, at the origin of the tertiary, these two tiered vertices of the monkeys seem to detach from the insectivore fan uh, of the tupiads and to represent a simple ray of tupiads in a fully unfolded state. But there is something else. At the heart of each of these two vertices, we distinguish a central subverticil with forms that are particularly cephalized. On the Lemurid side, the, the tarsids, teeny leaping animals with a round inflated cranium and huge eyes, whose sole survivor today, the Malaysian tarsier, strangely reminds us of a little man. On the Catarine side, the anthropoids, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, and gibbons, the tailless monkeys, which are the largest and most alert monkeys so familiar to us. Uh, part six.